Hello, I'm Dr. Meredith Sims, Associate Professor of Dance and Dance Program Coordinator at Coker University in Hartsville, South Carolina. And today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about scholarly and creative research in dance. And so sometimes this is a new idea for people. They haven't really thought about how research plays a role in dance as an art form, as an education form, and as a field in general. And so today I'm just going to share a little bit about what that research looks like in the field of dance. And there's really kind of two approaches to research in dance. One is scholarly, which is kind of our traditional approach um, to publications and conducting research, collecting data, that kind of idea. And then another one is creative research is where we're actually participating in the art form, um, creating dance, choreographing or participating in dance. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about both of those as we go on. And I am kind of referring to this as a way we work in higher education or in academia, the way research works in dance, but really it's the same for professional dancers and choreographers. And we are modeling that in higher education because many of our students intend to go on and be professional dancers, professional choreographers, and they're gonna need those research skills as well. So when we use these terms, when we talk about scholarly or creative research in dance, these are kind of two different approaches to research. And the first one is this idea of scholarly research is what we might typically be familiar with in other fields, which is this, um, you see a gap in the literature, you see a problem or an issue that needs to be addressed. You look through your, you conduct a literature review, what's already been done about this idea, where do we still need more information? And then you design a methodology and you plan an intervention or you have data collection, then you have some type of data analysis, you report those results and discussion, most likely in a publication or a presentation. And we certainly have that in dance. There are many dance scholars who are doing this type of work. Here's an example from the Journal of Dance Medicine and Science um, about injury incidents among belly dancers. And then another form of research we have in dance is this idea of creative research. And this is where you're really engaging in the creative and artistic process to create a uh, dance performance or an installation or a dance film or something like that. And this is where you're really engaging in the art form. It still goes through a similar process, like the creative and artistic process, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. But maybe some of those steps are maybe just a little bit different from what we do in scholarly research. And an example I have here is an image from the dance called Show Pony, choreographed by Kyle Abraham and performed by Tanisha Guy. And Kyle Abraham's dance company, Abraham in Motion, was in residence at Coker last year. And we were able to see this performance, um, this piece performed live at Coker. And this was a dance that was examining the performative role of Black women in society. So here was an idea or a concept that this choreographer wanted to explore. And then through the creative and artistic process created a dance that really examines what it's like for a Black woman having to perform various roles within society. So I'm gonna jump back just for a second and talk a little bit about this idea of scholarly research and what that looks like in dance. And it's really just like in other forms, there's such a broad area of things you could study that's the same for dance as well. So of course, dance pedagogy, looking at what are the best practices in teaching dance. And this can vary from early childhood, things with human development, and how do we use dance to reinforce other areas or what we call dance integration, all the way up to how do we best train professional dancers? What are the best teaching modalities for that? And then also a growing and very needed area is dance science, where we're looking at principles of anatomy and physiology and how those apply to dance training. What concepts can we take from sports medicine um, and exercise science? How do we apply those for dancers? Um, things about injury prevention, nutrition, wellness, all these concepts are is a really growing area for dance and much needed. There are scholars who are researching uh, methods and skills for improving artistic expression. Uh, of course, we have dance historians. We have a academic journal called Contact Quarterly, which is all about dance improvisation techniques. 
a growing area is dance therapy, both dance um, as it relates to things like physical therapy and occupational therapy in terms of uh, injury rehabilitation, but then also dance therapy as its own field, looking at dance for individuals who have experienced trauma or have emotional or behavioral issues. So just like we have art therapy or equine therapy, how is dance used in that way? And then another growing area is this idea of somatic principles. So um, this mind-body connection and how do we have a better somatic approach to human development. So all of these are really kind of this traditional approach that we often see in other fields. And we have dance academics and dance researchers and scholars who are looking into areas in all, um, all kinds of different ways. A lot of this is coming out in publications, in a presentation at an academic conference, um, perhaps in a poster presentation, different things like that. I'm gonna share just a little bit about my own uh, scholarly research. I happen to be on sabbatical this semester. So some of the research I'm engaging in is a continuation of some that I started in my doctorate program. And this is the development of an instrument called SoDance, which is the system for observing dance activities in the classroom environment, which is a modification of SoFit, which is a system for observing fitness instructional time. And basically this is a time sampling observation instrument that's used for a dance class where I observe and collect data on the students and I'm looking at how physically active are they in a dance classroom? Um, how much time is spent in different lesson contexts, like how much time is the instructor spending in classroom management, how much in fitness, how much in skill development, um, and then looking at teacher promotion of physical activity both in and outside of the classroom. And so um, I'm using this right now in some high school classes here in South Carolina, looking at some high school dance classes. And the initial idea here was an advocacy piece to say, um, you know, we know dance provides all of these wonderful, wonderful traits in the classroom, collaboration, communication, self-expression, creative thinking, creative problem solving, but also it's an active art form. Aren't we also getting some physical activity out of this? And so this instrument is being used to look at how much moderate to vigorous physical activity in VPA our students getting in a dance class. So that's when their heart rate is really elevated and they're starting to see some uh, physical fitness benefits from the dance class. And so you can see a breakdown here. This is of um, some, this isn't the current data set, but some data from a couple years ago of how students were spending their time in a dance class. The national recommendation is that students spend 50% of their physical education class in moderate to vigorous physical activity. And you can see here, that um, in the dance class, it was about 40%. And what we found was that that's under the national recommendation, but when compared to other SOFIT studies, students were actually getting more MVPA in a dance class than they were in a PE class. So both areas need to improve, but there is the potential for students to, to get more physical fitness benefits from a dance class than they do from a typical physical education class. You can also see the lesson context here, 44%, um, the most percent of the time was spent in skill development or dance technique, which seems pretty typical or something we would expect. And you can see here in teacher promotion of in or out of class physical activity that for the most part, the instructor about 72% of the time was not promoting physical activity. And this might be a nature of dance, right? It's not necessarily always our main goal of a dance class is for students to get physical activity um, benefits from it. We're usually working on skill development or on choreography for a performance. But this just gives us some more information about what's actually happening in these dance classes. And then we can use that um, to publish and to share with others and to try to advocate for more dance in the public schools. So this is an area of research that I have been working on and I'm continuing to work on. And I really consider this, you know, traditional scholarly research where I'm out at a site collecting data, I'm analyzing that data, and then we'll be writing it up for publication. And there's many, many dance educators and scholars and academics who are doing research just like this. And, you know, this kind of follows this traditional approach of the scientific method that we've learned, you know, so many times about 
you see a problem or you have a question and then you're trying to find out what do we already know about this issue? How could we improve it? How could we solve it? How could we find out more information? Then you kind of have to do some experiments, some trial and error, try to draw some conclusions and then share out what you have found. And really our research process is really a derivative of this approach where we come up with this idea and we, we kind of study it and look at it. How could we make this better? What's missing? Um, and then we present those findings. And so similar to this is this idea of the creative process that we have in dance and creative research. It really varies across art forms and music, theater, visual art, creative writing, some of these other more creative forms but it's still really similar to that research process. We're just doing it through a different medium. And often the artist is using their form like dance to research the topic. And then we're presenting it um, to address that topic. And so while that the, the, it's a little bit different from that traditional approach, there's still this idea of you see a problem, an issue, something you want to investigate, and then you actually use dance or music or whatever the form is to explore and investigate more about that idea. And then you present that to an audience to get them to think about that idea or to have a greater awareness. So just like in scholarly research, we report or publish our findings so others will begin to have a greater awareness or they can have more information. We do that through the arts as well. One of the large differences is that often the creative process is the research. So the actual making the dance or making the sculpture or whatever it is, is actually where we find um, the research is happening with the participants or with those who are going to experience that art form. And a little bit of a difference or, or maybe a major difference <laughs> in creative research is that while a lot of times in academic research or scholarly research, we are trying to be very objective and remove bias. And we want it to be that if you were to do this study exactly the same way again, you would get the exact same outcome. In the arts, we often don't believe that at all. We say we embrace the bias that I'm saying, this is how I see it. This is my experience and I'm gonna share it with you. And then we have the expectation that when an audience comes to see the dance, or view the artwork in a museum or an art gallery, they're going to have their own experience with that art form because they're going to bring in their own biases and their own experiences and their own life choices that might um, flavor or color how they interpret that artwork. And we really embrace that and say, yeah, this is how it is for me. How is it for you? And so in creative research, we're not necessarily solving an issue, but we are raising awareness and perhaps wanting our audience to think about something, see it in a new way, or leave with some additional conversations about that. And an example of this, you can see this image that I have here is from a piece called On Display, choreographed by Heidi Latsky. And she has a dance company called Heidi Latsky Dance that is a mixed ability dance company. And the majority of her dancers um, are of various abilities. So some have forms of paralysis, some use wheelchairs or crutches, some have specific diseases or conditions like spina bifida that mean their body moves differently. And she really embraces that. And in this piece called On Display, you can see here it's performed in an art gallery. And when the piece is happening, the dancers are moving and the audience is encouraged to walk amongst the dancers and dance with them. So they're having an experience of what does it look like for bodies of different abilities, of different movement capabilities, different shapes and sizes? What is it like to see them dance? What is it like to dance with them? So you're having this experience that hopefully breeds empathy and understanding for those that might be different. And that would be a great example of creative research. Um, another really famous example of creative research um, I'm going to skip ahead, sorry, is the musical A Chorus Line, which you may or may not be familiar with, but this very famous musical uh, conceived, choreographed, and directed by Michael Bennett in 1975 was this really groundbreaking musical where he 
uh, started to notice that in all of the Broadway shows, there was a lot of glitz and glamour. They were really beautiful. It was about escapism. It was about going to see this other place, but there was really very little known about the chorus members, the performers, the dancers who were kind of in the background, maybe the townspeople or the large groups. And all of the fame and excitement was on these soloists, the, the leads, the big stars, but we didn't really know about these background dancers and performers. And so using a qualitative method approach, Michael Bennett invited several chorus members over and for like 12 hours one night, he interviewed them and he recorded all of those interviews and he started taking notes and then he transcribed the interviews and those the the language the text that came out of that was actually put back together to make the musical a chorus line which is all about the audition process for a musical and it was this huge success that kind of broke the fourth wall, allowed people to learn about these people they might not have known about. And he used their actual words to make up the dialogue and the songs for that show. So that's a really famous example of an artist using a, a qualitative method approach of um, transcribing interviews, looking for themes, looking for um, major points that might stand out. And then he organized those into a musical to share with the public. So just like we have these steps in the scientific method and the research process, we also see those in the creative process. And, um, you know, Graham Wallace, who was a theorist, wrote a book called The Art of Thought in 1926, which really is where the first kind of organized idea of the creative process started. And it at first only had four steps and it's now expanded to five. And you'll see a lot of similarities. There's this idea of at first, this step one in prepare, you're just gonna kind of start to think about something or notice something. And you might see a problem or something you're interested in and want to investigate. From there in this step to incubate, this is really where um, you might start reading other things about it kind of like your literature review. So what's already been done? You might look at other works of art who have already explored this topic. What other choreographers or dancers have already done something about this? What visual artists have made paintings or sculptures about this? What music is about? And you start to kind of look at what's already out there. How have they addressed it? Then um, this is a lot of that trial and error. So for dancers, this means we go in the dance studio and we start to improvise. Uh, we start to choreograph, come up with ideas, gestures or movement that reflect and, uh, the topic that we're interested in. So this might mean, right, if I'm interested in investigating something about um, the stock market, I might think about highs and lows. And so choreographically with movement, I might start looking at movement that goes up and then drops down, things that gradually build up and then crash. So I might Often this is common for choreographers where we might write down a lot of words that come to mind when we're thinking about this topic. Or if I'm reading research about the idea I'm interested in, I start highlighting or circling words that keep coming up or that really encapsulate what the idea is. And then from those words, I create gestures or movement that reflects that idea. Then we move into the step three of illuminate. This is where something comes out of it. This is for us in dance, the rehearsal process. We're working with other dancers and starting to kind of fine tune this movement I started creating. I'm going to go, oh, this is working. This is telling the idea I have. In evaluate, this is where we really look at the dance. We might have other guests come in, just like in um, the review process for published manuscripts. You get feedback from reviewers. There's this whole process for publication. In dance and in the arts, we have that as well, where I will present the dance to other choreographers or other artists for critical feedback. And they're gonna say, this part, this is what it looked like to me. Here's what I was seeing. Here are the questions I have. And I use all of that to edit and revise the dance. And then that last step is really where we present or perform that piece. And there's a lot of similarities between these ideas in the sciences or in research and the same things we use in the creative and artistic process where there's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of revising. Um, there is a lot of kind of really investigating what this idea is about. 
And so I'm just going to share with you a little bit about my own creative research, a couple pieces that I've created over the past couple years. Um, a piece I created in uh, 2018, I believe. Yeah, 2018 was a piece called These Feet Were Made for Talking. And I was really kind of going in the vein of a sneaker ballet inspired by Jerome Robbins, which had happened to be his 100th birthday this year when I was making this work. And he's a huge influence on me. But I was really interested in the idea of communication. So at this time, I was just seeing more and more, of course, and it's only grown since then, our communication changing into digital forms where um, we're more and more talking through email, through text, um, even less on the telephone. Uh, students were really communicating at that time through Snapchat um, and online. And so we started creating, looking, I, I talked to my dancers, to the cast, you know, how do you communicate and how do you talk to different groups of people? Like, how do you talk to your best friend and how do you talk to your crush? How do you talk to your parents? How do you talk to your professor? How do you talk to a medical professional? And so we just started looking at how a lot of these forms of communication varied depending upon who you were talking to. And from that, we really started working on these dances and movement that kind of reflected what came out of those conversations. So for example, these first two pictures over here, we're really seeing were about this idea of everyone shouting at once, everyone talking at once, and all of us having the ability to share our thoughts. So kind of in social media, right? I can post anything up on Twitter or Facebook or wherever, whatever I'm using. And it's just a lot of people kind of shouting out into the abyss. And so these, these first two images of all four of the dancers kind of very frontal, face forward, shouting, that's where that movement came from. Um, and this was kind of set up in little vignettes. So the next scene was really about these one-on-one -on -one conversations. So you can see now they're kind of in these little duets. They're getting in each other's faces. They're kind of some push and pull. Um, these ones where they're on the floor, this was the idea of talking on the phone, laying in bed and you're staring at a screen and constantly needing stimulation. So you'll notice that we're arranging the dance to reflect how people were communicating. Um, here were some other sections of the dance. You'll notice over here on the left, these dances was when we were talking about um, everyone just kind of talking to themselves, but nobody's actually listening to anyone else. So you'll notice none of them are looking at each other. They're all doing different moves at the same time. Um, so it's kind of this idea of us all talking, but no one's actually listening. In these darker pictures on the right, the one at the top, was where we worked on this little idea of like kind of a soloist. Somebody goes in and we all have to listen to them talk nonstop and there's not a lot of kind of conversations back and forth. And then this bottom one, we were playing with ideas about emojis and how we communicate through symbols. And so these were the monkey emojis of hearing, seeing, listening, whatever the hands are. And so really it was just a lot of kind of movement that reflected what we were trying to say about communication and what we were investigating. So that's just one example. Another piece is I created in 2019 called Dual Dual. And this was a piece that was um, looking at this idea of binary thinking and that right or wrong, yes or no, black or white. And I was seeing this more and more, particularly in political discourse in our country, but not just that, all kinds of things. And that um, so I was reading about the, the concept of binary thinking, a lot of kind of academic literature, and then also just looking at things in social media and in pop culture about I'm right, you're wrong, and really kind of drawing this line down the middle, and it's us against you, or it's, it's them, and the, I mean that there was no gray area. And this kind of led to some ideas about sports culture. So I'm just going to kind of start this video and let it play uh, while I talk a little bit about our process. So I spoke with the dancers quite a lot about binary thinking and how this showed up for them in their life. And, you know, things got heavy. The conversations were kind of heavy. So to kind of spin that and still have a little bit of levity, we put this in the sports culture world. And I'm just going to skip forward a little bit, but you'll see this piece starts with a referee coming out and he tapes this long um, line down the middle of the stage. And then we have our dancers enter and they are clearly kind of on a sports team. And they're warming up and they're getting ready for this big battle to fight the other team. 
and then um, you'll see the other team enters. And so we're kind of setting up this opposition of binary thinking. There's only one, one person can be right. Where I actually believe that so much of everything lives in the gray area is actually about these really complicated issues where there's not a right or wrong, and perhaps it's contextual. So this dance really meant to have a sense of humor, but really we're digging into this idea about opposites and competition and why do we feel pitted against others and how will we find resolution and, and these kinds of ideas. And I'm just gonna skip forward so you can kind of see what happens here as these dancers kind of go back and forth against each other. And it has, this one has quite a lot of pantomiming and acting. And in fact, the man who's playing the referee is one of our theater majors at Coker. So that's just one example. I'm gonna keep going because there's lots of different ways this can go. My most recent work that I worked on this past year was called Float Aware. And this was a trio where we're really exploring these ideas of, about the theory of flow. So this idea that you can really like get in the zone and you can have a one track mind and you can start working on something and you don't notice anything else around you. And um, it, it can be quite isolating. But a lot of people who are highly successful have this drive and this get into this concept of flow and it can be isolating, but it can lead to a lot of success. So this was a trio where these three dancers are really, you'll notice in the whole dance, they never see each other. They never dance with anyone else. They are always on their own path. And um, we really worked as a cast. We watched a lot of stuff and read a lot about the theory of flow and some, some articles, some chapters from the book about it. Um, a lot of different things and we tried to achieve flow in the in the dance and you'll notice a lot of times in the choreography they are actually spelling out the word flow with their bodies I'm going to keep going because there's um I'll show you some other sections of the dance but a lot of times they're actually spelling out the word flow with their bodies here if you can see sapphire this dancer in the green she is actually spelling flow right now in a lot of different ways with her limbs. And I'm gonna keep going into this next section because you'll really see these dancers, I'm gonna jump ahead a little, but you'll see them right here kind of move into what we call hyperdrive or hyperflow where they don't see each other. They're simply dancing into this system of focus. And the dance kind of culminates with them moving into this kind of hyper drive and they, they come forward and it ends kind of with exhaustion. So this was just a way for us to in the creative process, these students are learning about flow. We're examining how do you achieve flow? Is it worth it? Um, and then we're presenting that for an audience to kind of figure out what and where they wanna go with that or what does that mean to them or what do they pull from it? And um, it's okay if that's not really what the artist intended, that happens quite a lot. And I think, you know, one of the best ways to see how research plays itself out in dance is to see more dance. And so I'm going to provide some resources on the website for you to see. But here are some other examples of great places where you can see dance for a lot of it for free and start to see like what is the artist, what are the choreographers trying to say with these images, with these um, with this choreography, what is the message and then and trying to dig in a little bit deeper. And, you know, the musician Lou Reed famously talked about research that, that that's really how we get anywhere. So to me, you know, I, I say to the students all the time, everything is research. Everything we do is research and information for us to use in the future. Um, I love to talk about this stuff. I'd love to dance with you if you ever wanted to dance and, and find out more about how we uh, use research in our creative process. 
So if you have any questions or would love to know more, please feel free to email or call me. And thanks for listening today.